Okay. <clears throat> so uh, yesterday we talked about what, what it means to be an almost G2 manifold. Uh, so today we will start with what it means to be a G2 manifold. And of course, first you need a Um, you need to be an almost G2 manifold, okay? So given, so let M phi be an almost G2 manifold. Um, recall that phi gives us a metric, so we get a Riemannian metric, right? So that gives us a connection, the Levitschewitz connection, which we'll just denote by nabla. Uh, so we say that M phi is a G2 manifold if this, this three form is, is parallel. Uh, with respect to the uh, Levitschewitz connection that it induces. Um, now, so so this definition is equivalent to having a holonomy group inside the uh, G two. So if you look at the hol Riemannian holonomy group of the metric, well, all right, let's just use the uh, letter G. Um, so MG is a G2 manifold if and only if uh, the holonomy group, the remaining holonomy group is, is inside G2. I mean, basically the idea is um, if, if, if phi is parallel, then, then you know, under parallel transportation, um, it, it, it will be you know, fixed, of course. So, if you, if you look at the all possible, you know, I mean, the holonomy group at a point, you know, all, all, after all possible actions, you see that the phi is fixed. So that's by definition is a subgroup of G two. Um, well, of course, it's an isomorphic copy of G two. Um, and then, if, uh, you know, if this condition is true, then you can just par parallel transport to any two point, and. Uh, I mean, so if, if this is true, then the, the if, if you um, basically the phi has to be parallel, right? Uh, the the, the covariant derivative has to be zero. Right? Um, now, if Fernandez and Gray um, express this relation. Uh, Uh, b being a G2 manifold in, a, in an equivalent, a different way, um, they said that M phi is a G2 manifold. They proved that M, M phi is a G2 manifold if and only if phi is closed and co-closed. Okay, so uh, d phi is zero and d star phi is zero. So here. Um, Note that this this the, this hard star depends on metric and volume form, and they're both induced by phi itself, right? So because of for this reason, the second equation is actually nonlinear, right? Uh, because this star also depends on phi. So they, 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 this is a different equivalent uh, characterization of being a G two manifold, and uh, and of course over a compact manifold. Uh, this is the same thing as being a, a har harmonic. Um, so again, manifold is uh, is a G two manifold. Um, if and only if and only if the the, the three form is, harmo is a harmonic three form. 
So in, in, the, in that case, these two are equivalent. Um, okay, so, so what are some examples of G2 manifolds? I mean, there are of course some trivial ones, so let's maybe let's start with those. Um, Uh, like for example, on R7, you can you can use the phi that we defined. Just I mean, think of R7 as a manifold now, and phi is this constant three form. That's the you know the three form that we defined on the imaginary octonions, right? It's, uh, it's, you can identify that with R7, of course, and it's just a constant form. So this would be a G2 manifold. But in this case, uh, actually the whole number group is trivial. Um, or uh, again, from this construction, you can, because phi is constant anyway, this this uh, this you can also carry this over to the quotient of R seven, so that you get T seven, uh, you know, quotient by the lattice. And I, again, the whole number group would, in this case would be trivial. Um, um, other examples are so if you take a perhaps more interesting examples are. Uh, for example, K3 cross T3, uh, if you take a K3 surface and cross it with T3, T3 um, so here we, we're t considering the flat torus again, and uh, just any like K3, K3 surface, which, so, and K3 surface has a, has the whole number group of K3 surfaces is SU2. So the uh, whole number group of this thing will be the you know, cross product of the two, I mean the so basically, it's just SU2, which is a subgroup of uh, G2. Um, and, and, okay, actually here we can, more concretely, we can write down the, the, the three form as follows. So if Xi are coordinates on the T3, X1, X2, X3, right? Uh, then we can take this form, the X1, 2, 3, um, minus the sum over i from 1 to 3, the xi veg uh, omega i, uh, and omega 1, 3, 1, 2, 3 are the symplectic structures on uh, k3. Um, and I mean, this this notation just means that it's the wedge product of dx1, dx2, dx3. Uh, so this would be a concrete way to write down the uh, positive three form. And so another example is if you take a color vl threefold and cross it with s1. Uh, this will have all number group in uh, SU3, and this is again a subgroup of uh, G2. Uh, by the way, the fact that these two groups are subgroup of G2 follows from the from our observation, where where we said that G2 acts transitively on two frames. Right? You, using that, uh, you can figure out th that these two are true, and that's let's leave it as an exercise, um, and the. On a Calabria threefold, you have a holomorphic three form and the, I mean, holomorphic volume form and the symplectic structure. So the way you write down phi here, let's say, let's say the coordinate here is t. So the positive, you, you write down the positive three form by um, taking the real part of this holomorphic uh, three form and then minus dt veg. Omega. So this is a concrete way to uh, write down the positive three form. Okay. Um, so these are some examples, but of course, in all these examples, you see that actually the whole number group is is a proper subgroup of G two. So the so a na natural question is, you know, whether there are, you know, G two manifolds whose whole number groups are actually equal to G two rather than being a, just a proper subgroup. Um, and uh, the answer to that is yes, uh, the f as first proven by Bryant. Uh, 
Robert Bryant in 1987. Well, um, there exists holonomy G2. So Robert Bryant said that there exists holonomy G2 manifolds equal to G2. But his the first example he constructed was an open subset of R, uh, R7 and uh, it was also it's not a complete uh, Riemannian manifold, and then uh, Bryant and Solomon in '89 uh, proved that you know there exists a well, it's not unique. Uh, proved prove that there exists a holonomy equal to G2 manifolds, which are uh, complete, but this is still non-compact. And finally, um, in Dominic Joyce in 1996, uh, I mean around those years, uh, showed that there exists a compact holonomy G2 manifold. Um, and you know, ever since there, there have been lots of attempts at constructing more and more examples. Um, okay, so. Now, I mean, today I, I quickly want to get to the um, like the complex G two manifolds. Uh, but before that, uh, like G two manifolds that have like interesting submanifolds. So I want to quickly discuss those objects. Um, all right. So so here's a definition. If we have an inner product space Vg, V comma G, uh, and the K form uh, on this inner product space, we say that, okay, so beta is called a calibration form. Um, if the absolute value of beta E1 through EK is less than or equal to 1 for all uh, orthonormal E1 through EK. Okay, so in this case we say, we say that the, this form, this K form is called a calibration form and this vector space with the calibration form is called a calibrated space. Okay. Um, so this is the reason why we call these uh, like special three form and a four form like associative calibration and uh, Cayley calibration. I mean, we were calling them you know, associative calibration and Cayley calibration, but we didn't really you know say why they were called calibration forms. But this is the reason, and it's an exercise to prove that these things are uh, actually uh, like examples of calibration forms. Mm -hmm. So it's an exercise to prove that um, phi. And in fact, the, the metric dual of phi, like this, you know, star, star phi is also a calibration form. So these are calibration forms, calibration three and calibration four forms uh, on, um, let's say, R7 or, um, and, and the, this capital phi that we define is a calibration form on R8. Um, okay, so um, once you have a calibrated space, uh, a calibrated vector space, you can talk about some special um, K planes inside, inside that space, which uh, satisfies this um, I mean, this is an inequality, but when this equality becomes equality, an equality, um, it, that k plane is called basically a uh, calibrated uh, plane. Okay, so more precisely, so if v g beta is a calibrated um, is a calibrated space. 
Um, well, okay, let let V G beta be a calibrated space. Um, then a K plane. Let's denote it by lambda. Is called uh, calibrated. Um, if it has an orthonormal basis, such that when you plug in those you know vectors in there, uh, it, the beta gives you one. So if it has orthonormal basis E1 through EK such that beta E1 through EK is equal to one. All right. Um, okay. So, um, so when you have a calibrated plane so if you, if you have a calibrated k-plane inside a calibrated space, uh, it, it, it is naturally oriented, right? Because if you ch change the order here, uh, the beta will be negative one. So you may just declare that, you know, this is an orthonormal ba uh, or oriented basis. Yeah, I mean, the, the basis that will give a positive value on beta is an or uh, oriented basis. So you, 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 that way you can uh, orient these planes as well, if, you, if, if necessary. All right, so, um, and, and of course, like, because these are these three, you know, phi, star phi, and the, you know, those capital phi, the, the Kähler calibrations are calibration forms, there are corresponding calibrated uh, planes, you know, associated to them. And uh, so, okay. A calibrated three plane um, in all right, let's just say R7 again. R7 phi is called associative. Um, all right, so the, uh, there'll be a few, you know. Similar statements, so perhaps let's let's state them. Oops. Like this, so that it's just easier to write. So if you have a cal calibrated uh, four plane, calibrated with respect to this star phi, then it's co called co associative. And a calibrated four plane in R8 with a Kähler calibration. Is called uh, a Cayley plane. All right, uh, and well, we can think about like, what's the set of like the, uh, all, for example, associative um, planes, uh, which we call like the associative Grassmannian. And G two actually has a transitive action on, on those things with the stabilizer group SO four. The set of all. associative planes is called associative Grassmannian um, and it's so as I said it has a G, transitive G2 action with a with a stabilizer group SO4 so that's that's isomorphic to this now, uh, because in, in, in this seven-dimensional space, well, okay. So, so if, you, if, you, if you have an associative plane, and if you look at its uh, orth orthogonal complement, then it will be a four-plane, and in fact, you can prove that it's a, it's, it's, it will be a co-associative plane. And similarly, if you have a co-associative plane, it's perpendicular, I mean, it's orthogonal complement will be uh, an associative plane. So these two objects are one-to-one, are in one-to-one -one correspondence. So the co-associative Grassmannian is also the same space. And <coughs> uh, 
Um, and then you can also think about the set of all Cayley planes. And um, so that's called Cayley Grassmannian. And that space is, uh, like there's a spin seven action on that, transitive spin seven action on that, with a stabilizer group SU2 cross SU2 cross SU2, uh, and mod out by uh, Z2. So this modding out happens in the stabilizer group, and then you mod out spin seven by that. And actually this, this whole thing actually it's not very difficult to show that this is isomorphic to grass minus of three planes in seven space, actually. So in some sense, this is a you know, well-known space. Um, this this you know, happens to be a well-known space. Um, and actually, I mean, so here are discussions over real numbers, but you can actually sort of also think about the corresponding complex notions. And there, uh, actually, this space uh, lo lo looks a little bit different. Um, so, in particular, it becomes a singular variety, actually. Um, but, so, so, my point is, like, its com complex version is actually uh, not uh, well known. Um, it, it's not just a, you know, complex grass mining of three planes in the same space. So this is not the whole story. Okay, so I mean these are all you know it, these are all the things that are happening in a single vector space, uh, but we can sort of do this over a whole manifold, and then uh, for example we can define a calibrated manifold. Okay, uh, we take a Riemannian manifold. And the beta is a K form on M. Um, it's, a, it's a closed uh, K form. If beta restricts to a calibration form, At every tangent space, it is called a calibration form. And um, so, if you have a you know G, G two manifold uh, and I mean, so for, for a G2 manifold, uh, you know, the phi has to be closed. So automatically, the, that becomes a, uh, I mean, calibration form on the manifold, right? And it's, uh, the whole thing will be called, it can also be called a calibrated manifold. Uh, so the, and similarly, so we can define the sub-manifolds of these things, uh, which will be called uh, calibrated sub-manifolds, and they, they satisfy, um, something very interesting. So if this is a calibrated manifold, and um, X is a closed, well, compact uh, K sub manifold, such that, uh, the volume form on, of X, the Riemannian volume form of X, is just the restriction of beta to X. Then X is called a calibrated manifold. The calibrated sub manifold, I mean. 
And uh, a remarkable fact is that uh, such things are volume minimizing within their homology classes. Um, and it's, it's just proven by a single line. Um, so let's, let's quickly state that. Calibrated submanifolds are, are volume minimizing in their homology classes. All right, so, um, so say X is calibrated and uh, X prime is homologous to X. Uh, then the volume of X is the integration of beta over x and because x and x prime are uh, homologous this is the same thing as x prime integrated over beta but this is less than or equal to x prime with its own volume form uh, which is the volume of x prime so this this one line shows that this calibrated submanifolds are actually volume minimizing so that's why this uh, you know uh, I mean, people are interested in understanding calibrated submanifolds because, you know, again, they're volume minimizing. Um, okay, and, you know, again, as usual, uh, if you have a G2 manifold, um, the, the three submanifolds will be called, I mean, calibrated three submanifolds will be called associative, calibrated four submanifolds will be called co-associative, and for, if you have a spin seven manifold, the calibrated four manifolds will be called Cayley. Um, well, so by the way, you can. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, oh, we're, well, I guess I erased it. Yeah, yeah, I, I wrote it actually. Uh, um, so, so yeah, I mean, whenever you plug in orthonormal vectors, it, it, sh it can be at most one in absolute value. Yeah. Um, um, so okay. Uh, I mean, here you need a closed, uh, like, so for this proof to work, you need a closed form and uh, like a compact submanifold. But sometimes we will sort of relax these conditions and we'll still call these things like calibrated submanifolds or associative and so on. But you should be careful. Like, we, sometimes um, uh, the objects that we would consider won't be uh, satisfying this inequality, actually. Uh, so, for example, if you talk about just almost G2 manifolds, you can still uh, uh, talk about submanifolds, which um, you know satisfy this condition at every point, satisfy this, this condition at every point, and you know we will continue to call these things like associative, co-associative, or Cayley, whatever. Um, but you know you should be careful. So um, this this argument only works if if beta is closed and then uh, the manifold is compact. Okay, so now I want to talk about the, like our, our sort of re recent work with uh, Selman, where we d developed the theory of like uh, some complex G2 manifolds and like their connections with symplectic uh, topology. Um, uh, while, while trying to answer what, like th this question the, they had with uh, Sema Solur uh, w when they were trying to, uh, okay, so the question is this one. So you have a G2 manifold and an associative submanifold there. So basically, so what are the uh, so if if you want to move that associative sub uh, submanifold within that G2 manifold while staying associative, so like what are the conditions that, that to to keep that submanifold uh, associative? And uh, so they they came up they came up with uh, some equations which look very very much like the Cyber Witten equations, but uh, you know Cyber Witten equations have two parts. And uh, they, they like came up with the first part like naturally. However, the second part didn't really. Uh, they, they sort of imposed the second part. 
Um, so we, we were trying to fill in that gap. And while we were doing that, we sort of started thinking about complex G2 manifolds. And then uh, basically that second equation uh, came up. Um, so, so basically for the rest of my talk, I'll be uh, trying to talk about that story very quickly. Um, I mean, I, I have, I guess, like about 30 minutes. Right? Yeah. All right. Um, so, and, okay. So first of all, so let's call it complex G2 or like sometimes G2C manifolds and connections with uh, simplex topology. Let's give this as the name of our section now, just with simplex topology. Uh, so let me qu quickly remind you that the, the I mean, so for the complex G2, we will use the same definition that we used for G2. Like it's just the automorphism group of the octonians. It's just uh, complex octonians, right? In the initial construction that we wrote down, you just take everything to be complex. Uh, so, I mean, this this O is again, you know, the, the you can think of it as O tensor C, you know, if, you, if you're sort of thinking about the real octonians. So the G2C is still an automorphism group of the octonians, and then it's possible to prove that uh, very similar to the real picture. However, we have an extra condition here now. G2C is a subgroup of um, SL7C. Let's express it that way. It's a subgroup of SL7C, which fixes this associative calibration, okay? So we also complexify that associative calibration. It's just, uh, it's a complex three form. It gives values in complex numbers. Like, you just complexify everything. So the extra condition that, that's here now in the complex story is that this is SL7C rather than GL7C. Um, And then, well, we already talked about what it means to be an almost G2 manifold. So we'll define what it means to be an almost uh, G2C manifold this, the same way. Um, oh, well, okay, before that actually, uh, I also wanna define a couple of uh, like other notions. So we will define something called G2 space or a G2C space. So let's start with G2C. We call this quadruple V phi uh, omega B. So this is isomorphic to C7. It's a complex vector, seven dimensional vector space. The, all, all of these are complex forms. Um, this is basically like the complex volume form um, and it's a complex symmetric bilinear form. So it's just the, like the objects that we already discussed. They're all just, everything is complex now. Um, so we call this quadruple that satisfies uh, this equation. And the norm squared of um, volume form is one. Um, a G2C vector space. I mean, it's a, shortly we will say G2C space. Okay. Um, and again, this N is the qua associated quadratic form, associated to this bilinear form. And then this is the induced uh, norm squared. Okay. Um, and we can also define, like a, in a similar fashion, we can also define um, like a, what it, so a G2 space. So now this is a R R7, and this is positive. So this, we will call this a G2 space. I mean, we could have given this definition earlier, I guess, but um, we'll just call this a G2 space because 
uh, but I mean, I mean, keep in mind that, of course, this, the, our real numbers, would, if this is positive, of course, it deter de determines a unique volume form and the metric that satisfies this, these two equalities. So even though we only write these two down, uh, it actually it comes with all this package, actually. So, but we, we can also do the same thing over real numbers. Okay. Um, so now we will. So now we'll do. A very like seemingly naive uh, construction. Okay, so what we will do is we will start with a G2 space. Okay, and then of course this gives you V, phi, omega, and B. You know, these are all real uh, objects at the moment. And we will just simply complexify everything. So, every, so complexify everything. Okay, so it will look like V plus IV, comma, phi, let's say C here, omega C, and BC. So these just means complex linear extensions of these things. So this is a very, you know, naive way to complexify this thing. And uh, this, con this equation will continue to hold. So this is still a G2C space. Okay, so perhaps this is not very interesting because uh, like all we did was uh, complexify everything. However, uh, now uh, we, we could do something, well, all right, maybe. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I wanna use a consistent notation, so let me check. All right, let's 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 change this B to G, okay? I mean, it's the same object; it's just a metric, right? And you just complexify it here as well. Okay. So this is still a G two C uh, space. So so far, you know, it's, it seems very boring. But what you can do is actually starting here, we could have also extended this G uh, in 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 one of the components complex anti-linearly in the second component. So we get a Hermitian form, okay? So, so we could also extend uh, G Complex anti-linearly in the second component to get um, a Hermitian form, and in that case, this Hermitian form becomes uh, so you get a positive definite metric plus i times a symplectic structure. Okay, so this is positive definite. And this here is a symplectic structure. I mean, as usual. So, so this naive way to complexify this and, and adding this very, you know, again, like simple twist actually helps us, uh, you know, get this new 14 dimensional space that has both a G2C structure, but then also a, a symplectic structure. So now we can actually start talking about the compatibility of uh, G2C structures, I mean G2 structures with uh, symplectic structures, right? So basically, we say that the, these, these two structures are compatible if they basically arise from this construction. So I don't want to give the full like technical definition. I'll just quickly state it that way. Um, so we say this G omega and phi C is called compatible on a, on, um, 
Well, by the way, okay, so this is on on the tensor C. Okay, uh, it's called compatible. I mean, all of these things are again on a on a comp uh, vector space that is like C seven. That looks like C seven. Okay, we say that these three structures is, is called. I mean, we say that these three structures are compatible if uh, they basically arise from this structure, uh, this this procedure. So this complexification procedure. Okay. Um, and at this point, uh, this may resemble you the sort of the Kähler picture, right? Where where you have um, an almost complex structure, a symplectic structure, and a metric, and the N2 determines the third one, right? And that relation is is encoded like at the group level. It is encoded by these. Uh, this intersection of these groups. Um, so all, all three of them intersect, uh, the intersection of all three of these, I mean, any two of those is, is equal to UN. Um, and here, SP2N is just the symplectic group. That is just a uh, you know, linear group that preserves the standard symplectic structure on R2N. Um, so in our picture, um, basically, the, the, so we, we have these two intersections uh, ca canonically. I mean, OK. So we can intersect the G2C with the orthogonal group, or G2C with the symplectic group. And in both cases, we get the compact G2 group. Okay? So the intersection of these two is, is, is just G2. Uh, I mean, the compact G2. Um, so that, that, that's the sort of difference uh, uh, in this, in this like, G2 case, right? Um, Okay, um, so, like, uh, so as I said, so we want to actually consider the like deformations of associative submanifolds, right? And uh, but but over like if you have a complex G two uh, manifold, then actually you can like define a new type of uh, manifold, which is just uh, adding some extra condition to being associative. Um, Right, so okay, I'll I'll I'll, st I'll sort of define that lo lo uh, point-wise first. I mean, yeah, we still haven't you know talked you know really wrote down what what it means to be complex G two, but uh, you know again it's it's sort of clear how to define that. So let's define what it, what associ uh, isotropic associative planes are, or the grass mining is. Um, so uh, remember, we said that some, a plane, a, a three plane in, in you know, R7 is like associative if the restriction to phi is, gives you one, like if you, find a, if you can find an orthonormal basis, which, where, when, which when you plug into phi, it gives you one, right? So actually, over complex numbers, that definition is not very like, suitable. It's not good for computations. A better definition is is using this associated bracket. Um, so this is defined to be u cross b cross w plus b u b w minus b u w b. So you can sh say that you, you can show. So this is called associated bracket. I mean, over real numbers, um, so this is, a, you know, lambda is a associative plane if and only if the bracket vanishes, the bracket 
restricted to lambda vanishes. So setting something equal to zero is just like a nicer from, uh, from like an algebraic uh, geometry perspective, right? So this actually sort of, you can see this as things as like polynomials over some space, I mean on some space. Okay, um, so now we define, so, so now we take a three plane, a real three plane uh, in, in C7, or like the imaginary Octonians. Okay, we say L is isotropic associative if it's isotropic in the sense that in the sense of uh, symplectic topology, and it's associative in the uh, in this sense. So. The omega restricted to L should be zero, and two, the bracket restricted to L should be zero. Okay, uh, so we denote the space of all of these things with um, all of uh, isotropic associatives by I uh, three phi. What is it? Yeah. If you consider the first condition, where it's at the maximum dimension that allows you to still be isotropic, is basically half the dimension of the main pole, right? Yeah. So but like the second condition, like if you assume the first and the second pole, it is the maximum dimension of the sub main pole, so it's fine. Well, sorry, I, I didn't hear the like, second part. So, like, if you just assume the second condition, yeah, yeah, right? the, 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 yeah. then the maximum dimension, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which allows your isotropic plane will be satisfied. Yeah, yeah. Will be half the right, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Now, if you assume the first and the second condition, right? So uh -huh. then uh, basically, like, uh, what would be the maximal dimension of the subunit? Well, but I mean, so here, here we are actually uh, already saying that the L is, is L is a three plane. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're fixing the yeah, yeah. L has to be a three plane. But uh, um, and the associated bracket will not vanish, all right, let's see. Um, I'm just thinking abstractly. Yeah, okay, so the, if, actually the associator bracket will not vanish if, as soon as you have a four, like, four plane um, that are complex linearly independent. I mean, so, so like, if you have a four plane, uh, and, and if it sits inside a, well, I mean, if, if it has a basis which is, you know, complex linearly independent, uh, like a consist of complex linearly independent four vectors, then it's a, then it won't, like the associator will not vanish actually. So actually all, all in that sense three is the maximum. Yeah, yeah. But we're not actually looking at complex planes, so we're actually also looking at real planes, like, yeah. So that's, that's an extra uh, condition there. So yeah, we denote this uh, space by I3 phi, and we computed its uh, like tangent space. Uh, all right, let's see. So so the tangent space of I3 phi at L, where L is the sort of the standard E1, E2, E3 the isotropic associative, uh, that, that is just the, the, the real span of the first three basis vectors. Um, so this here, well, okay, I, I guess actually I have to be, I have to give a little bit more definition here. Um, I mean, just notation uh, before I can write down what this is. Um, all right, so again, let's let L be the real span of E1, E2, E3. So, right. Mm. So, this is not, so this is inside the C, you know, R7, but it naturally sits inside C7, uh, or imaginary Arctonians. 
as a as an isotropic associative uh, plane. Um, okay. So over. Okay. So let E denote the the tautological line bundle over the real grass bunny of three planes and fourteen sp dimensional space. Um, and uh, okay, so set V to be its perpendicular with respect to this uh, complex bilinear form. Okay, and E perp G. So okay, all right, all right. So we we define V to be the perp. Uh, Perpendicular uh, space of E in in the comp uh, with respect to this complex form, then the orthogonal complement of E with respect to the you know real metric is given by J E uh, plus V, and this is I mean this is just the standard almost complex structure on on, R, uh, on C seven so you can just think of it as I if you want. Okay. Um, so now the, the, we can write down what, what the tangent space is at L of the isotropic associative. So this will be given by the sum from I from one to three of EI tensor FI plus VI uh, in E star tensor, it's a real tensor, JE plus V. Uh, I mean, again, you know, J is the same thing as I. Uh, I mean, so this is how a, a, a tangent of a grass, you know, grass mining looks like in general. The condition is, um, so we have two conditions because we have like two uh, conditions over there, basically. The first one is the, this, this, the sum of these cross product is zero. And the second condition is the, with the symplectic form, it's uh, EI. Fj is equal to omega ej fi. So this is how you. Uh, this is how the tangent space looks like, and uh, so we will need this when we try to deform these, um, you know, isotropic associative submanifolds. Okay, so so quickly. A G two C manifold, well, an almost G two C manifold is is a fourteen manifold. It's a real fourteen manifold with G two C structure. So, G, by the way, G two C naturally sits inside um, S. Well, okay, uh, this natural sits inside. Uh, GL 14R. So, so this ma definition makes sense. So, you just take a real uh, 14 dimensional manifold and then you want its um, structure group to be G2C basically. Um, and then, like as we discussed yesterday, having that actually sort of gives you some, you know, immediate structures. So, in part, for example, you can pull back. Um, the complex structure so a G to C manifold naturally has um, an almost complex structure J and then once we have an almost complex structure we can express the other things uh, a complex Three form. So this is complex linear with respect to J, and then you know it's complex valued, and then complex linear volume form.
and the symmetric bilinear form. Okay. Um, so now you might ask whether what are like if there are you know examples of such manifolds, uh, and actually we can construct these. So so yeah, we have a like a general construction which is basically you start with a G two manifold, uh, like a real G two manifold. It's a seven manifold, right? And then we we put a G two C structure on its cotangent bundle. Okay. Um, I mean, there are some technical aspects of that, uh, which we'll just you know mention, but we won't be won't be able to talk about them much. Um, so let's M phi be a, like a real G two manifold. I mean, it can be almost G2 as well. Um, um, so now, okay, so as I said, we wanna put, put some structures on the cotangent bundle, okay? Uh, and for that, well, first of all, recall that phi gives you a metric, and we think of the metric as an isomorphism between the tangent bundle and the cotangent bundle, first of all. So using that, uh, like this, we can, I mean, phi, you know, phi is a three form, right? Uh, it's a three covector, but we can also think of it as a three vector because of this isomorphism that it naturally induces on itself. Um, so now, um, Well, okay, so therefore, let's, let's maybe write this here more concretely. So P star PM with phi is a G2 space. Okay, first of all, like if you just take one of, uh, one of the fibers of the cotangent bundle, um, that, that's a G2 space. We can just take this, uh, you know, phi, and using the metric isomorphism, we can put it there. Okay, so now, uh, what this bias us is that, so if you look at the vertical distribution over, I mean, of, of, the, of the cotangent bundle, uh, so each each fiber here, I mean the vertical sub like each uh, plane here in the vertical sub bundle is canonically isomorphic to that thing actually. So the the so so okay so well we have T star M projecting to pi here. I mean to M here, and this is push forward of pi. So uh, that, you know that's what we get, and of course like we have T. Uh, Okay, T is sub pi alpha there. Uh, so now the vertical part, which is the kernel of pi push forward, is canonically isomorphic to um, T pi alpha. All right, let, let me check this. Um, Okay, P star pi alpha M. Okay, but this is a G2 space. Right, that's, that, that's what that, uh, our discussion there showed us that. Um, so, so what we have is, we have this vertical distribution in the, in the tangent bundle of the cotangent bundle, right? We have this vertical distribution and each one of the, these planes, the seven planes, is actually a G2 space, okay? So actually, so now we can apply this, uh, compl I mean, we, we can apply this complexification procedure at every point. So every, uh, each one of those T alpha, T star M's will become a complex uh, G2 
uh, space. Of course, the question is then like whether uh, these, these complexifications are compatible with each other or not. Okay? And for that, what you do is you, you sort of look at the number of ways you can I mean, you know, do this procedure. So that, that actually depends on the possible com almost complex structures that you can choose. And you can show that uh, that's, uh, that's a com contractible space. Um, it's actually very similar to the story in the symplectic topology, but it's not exactly the same. There's some extra condition here. Um, so, so basically, you can find a global choice of, of an almost complex structure, and you can sort of do that procedure all at once. So, so that way, um, T star M becomes a G2C manifold. I mean, again, almost the G2C, but okay. Um, and in fact, in that process, if, if you sort of go through that process carefully, you will see that actually the, the symplectic structure that we're using is the, is the one that the cotangent bundle already has. It's the canonical symplectic structure. So in fact, this is a G2C manifold, with, so which is compatible with the canonical symplectic structure on T star M. So, so our examples are not only G2C manifolds, but they actually also have, a, have this sort of canonical symplectic structure on them. So they're, uh, they have a compatible uh, you know, symplectic structure as well. And so now uh, what that means is basically if we have an associative submanifold, Okay, I guess I'm, I'm running out of time. So let me, you know, in two minutes, try to conclude this. So now, what you can do is, uh, you know, starting with a G2C manifold. Um, well, maybe let's state this as a theorem. It, it'll be a little bit of a story. Um, Um, so, so, okay, so you start with Y inside a G2C manifold, uh, sorry, G2 manifold, and Y is associative, okay? So now you can apply this complexification procedure. So, so this sits inside T star M with, with all these structures, right, uh, like, uh, you know, everything like omega and so on. Um, and if you look at this inclusion of y in here, this actually now becomes isotropic associative. Uh, because it's, it, this actually sits inside, like, inside the zero section. So it's an isotropic uh, submanifold automatically. Uh, and it was associative to begin with. And now you can think about how, how to, uh, like what the, the formations of Y are that, that preserve the, I mean, being isotropic associative. Um, okay, so the formations of Y that keeps it uh, isotropic associative so you, you, you think about this question and you figure out what, like, what equations you get and you actually get are like the cyber witten type equations. So the, for, the formations of Y that keeps it associative are um, cyber witten type equations. So you uh, I I indeed get um, two equations. Well, okay, let's see. I guess at this point it's not very important, but what, what? you know, writing this down very concretely, but uh, uh, now you actually have uh, two equations that uh, corresponds to these two conditions that you have to satisfy. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, okay, so I, I ran out of time, so I'll, I'll stop here.